Professor Lee's talked about these small little devices you can wear and about things that you can press on and you can wear. And you have to have all of these devices communicate with something, a cell phone or some sort of, of uh, center that's going to then take that information, process it, and then transmit it. And although these devices are very small, they still have a problem of how do you then communicate with, say, other devices on your body or communicate with a center that's doing the computation. And what about delay between signal A and signal B? Suppose you're doing EKG or ECG, the electrocardiogram. And in electrocardiogram, you have to take the signals, you have to summate them in order to get the right uh, waveform. What, are, what if there are delays in, in transmitting that information? So body area networks need to work, they need to work well, and they have to work consistently. So a lot of what you're going to see I took from these people who did a, a very nice survey of body area networks, how they, how they operate and some of the problems. And the stuff that you're going to see is fairly recent. They're from articles that were published in uh, 2012, which means they're about six months out of date. And uh, <coughs> they give us a pretty good view of what body area networks look like now, what some of their problems are. So we're going to look at the history is how you use them and where we're going to go with body area networks. So we have all these sensors on our body and we have wired systems and wireless systems. And wired systems, I always thought of wired systems as being the easiest ones to deal with. So for instance, if you have um, a sensor over the heart, a sensor here and a, and a, uh, a ground sensor someplace else for EKG, you hook them into a central unit and then, of course, the signals are going to pump in synchronously when the heart pumps. So but the problems you have with those systems that wired is that the installation problems. For example, if you have multiple uh, uh, sensors on the body, they all have to plug into some uh, uh, unit. And you saw some of the pictures that Professor Lee had up of sensors that these people had cables running across their body in order to connect everything up. And that doesn't always work well. You can have a garment system like this, okay, which the wires are all entailed inside the garment and they're all connected up. And those work well, but you have to have them worn as part of a suit. There's high cost for maintenance of these. They have wires break if they're in a suit. You can have connections that go bad and they have to be uh, repaired. And it also can be cumbersome. Because So I was thinking, also, if you have these wires going into a, a connector somewhere on your body and it's not a part of a suit, then you know you do a gesture and this thing pops out, you get it caught in your arm, and it comes off and the sensor may come off. So there are lots of problems with, net, with wired networks, except wired networks don't have a lot of the problems that you end up with wireless networks. But if we could have wireless networks that are like wired networks in terms of their reliability, then we'd have a really good system where we could have multiple sensors all talking when they want to talk and getting reliable information. <clears throat> so for wired systems, um, there's more mobility. So you don't have to worry about things flopping around or things coming off because you're running or you're in bed and you know tussling in bed because you're having a, uh, a sleepless night or whatever. <clears throat> or you're on the couch watching some movie or reading a book and you turn around and some something would pop off. Easy application expansion of the network. So you have a sensor, you put a sensor on your body, it automatically connects up to the network, you don't have to wire it in. Uh, there's energy that you need to, that you need for the sensor and as the sensor gathers information. You can have a smartphone that acts as the sink where all the information would flow into. The problems that you have is with interference with other body area networks and also body shadowing. Two things that we'll talk about. Body shadow, shadowing uh, are, is just quite incredible, the amount of, of energy that's lost in the body. So the purpose of this, is this the right one? I thought we had moved this. I know. 
Uh, so the purpose, um, this is a protocol, the 802.15.6. This is a protocol for body area networks. And so here, uh, they're looking for a low power, high reliability, uh, quality of service here so that the information gets to the nodes and from the nodes, they get to the transmitter system. So some of the typical uses that you have for body area networks are EMG, ECG, EM, uh, for EEG. I mean, you can imagine someone who has a problem with intermittent epilepsy. Now, if you put electrodes on the head and you and you link them to your system, your system could have a, could have software that could determine that there's a high probability that you're going to have a seizure in the next five minutes or so. And you say, well, so what? But so what if you're driving a car? or you're walking across the street, or you're in a, in a situation where you want to get yourself into a, a posture where you're not going to hurt yourself or hurt anybody else. So these are very important things. And if you have something like that, and you were to get a response saying, there's a possibility of having a seizure or a heart attack or whatever, but it's not really going to happen because your network is being interfered with because someone is broadcasting on their CB radio or something. So there are all sorts of problems with reliability at this point. So these networks are uh, 10 kilobits per second to 10 megabits per second, low power, because especially if you have implant, implanted electrodes. They have uh, fairly short latency of 125 milliseconds. The uh, SARs, this is, this is specific absorption rate. Now the specific absorption rate is the uh, is the absorption rate of the body tissue. So one of the problems that you have with the uh, uh, SAR is that the specific absorption rate is not constant. Because your heart is pumping, you have blood flowing, you're moving around, and so tissues are moving. Uh, and as a function, the amount of absorption of the, of the energy changes as a function of time. And here, MICI refers to Medical Implant Communication Service. And it has a specific frequency that's used to communicate with implants. And the uh, ISM is Industrial Scientific Medical Radio Bands. And these are bands that are used, uh, uh, these are frequencies for uh, uh, industrial, scientific, and medical purposes other than communications. So, so here we have a, um, a wireless network. So this is a wireless sensor network. This is not a body area uh, network. And this would be uh, your standard mobile system. So here you have a, uh, a UAV is communicating with some ground stations. That's being connected up through a uh, an antenna system to go to a faraway location, maybe to another plane here. And you can see that here, you, if you need in a ground station to have more power, you just put more power in because these things are fairly stable. They have, uh, they, they can be very heavy and you don't have to really worry about how much power that you need in order to, excuse me, in order to reach uh, the, the network or uh, to communicate with other systems. And this is just an example of the uh, mobile sensor system here. <coughs> Body area networks, on the other hand, are, they better be low power. And, and as I was talking about before, if you have this person wearing a body area network which has a communication radius about this size, and this person over here has got a body area network of this size, these two are going to start to interfere possibly with each other. So that means as I get closer to Charlie, Charlie's information is going to start to come over to my system. And my system is going to think maybe it's, it's me and not him. And so what happens under those conditions? What happens if I start to skim off his information and then I can sell it to his insurance company <clears throat> or other kinds of things? So there are huge problems in terms of privacy 
and also in reliability when the, these networks start to interfere with one another. So here's a really good example uh, that they show here. Given your arm span here is two and a half meters from the tip of the finger to, to the tip of the finger, you know, how many body area networks are you going to start to interfere with? And how much interference can you handle? And there'll be some slides towards the end that it will just, when I looked at it, it would just completely stunned me. I couldn't believe that it was so, uh, th that the amount of, of loss, path loss in these networks were so high. So the problems that you have with body area networks is that the whole network is in, is in motion. It's not like the sensory networks that they're sort of fixed, and you may have a sensor that's moving around, but everything else is fixed, but they're not. The base station, the station that's going to gather up the information, transmit and receive, the base station is weak. The reason the base station is so weak is because you're wearing this. Everybody remember you know, using your cell phone and ending up with a brain tumor? Okay, so you have the same kind of problem here, except now, what if all your sensors start to transmit? Now you're wearing 10 sensors and they're all transmitting information. <coughs> you can have interference by the base station being in contact with other networks. So there are some things you say, well, I'm maybe just passing somebody on the street. Well, maybe not. Suppose you're at home and you're in a range for long periods of time with other family members, for example, that are also have body area networks. <clears throat> you can have nodes where the, uh, uh, you can be walking by a station that's transmitting at a certain frequency. You can be walking by your, uh, your neighbor who's using his, his portable phone at the same frequency, which could interfere with your, your network as well. So, there are a number of problems that have to be solved, and uh, wearing body area networks is because of these restrictions. The restrictions of having a weak system that's going to be transmitting information is a real problem. So what are we going to measure here? So with these systems, you can have all of these things being measured. You know, you have an artificial knee, you have pressure sensors on the foot, you have insulin injection, you have glucose measurement, you have uh, ECG, you have motion sensors, you have EEG, you have hearing aid cochleas. You can have many sensors that are on the body and are communicating with a single base station. So here we have uh, some of the devices that we uh, that we could have. And you have sensors, sensor nodes that are used uh, to gather information on physical stimuli. You have uh, a sensor hardware and power unit and processor uh, and memory and transceiver. So these inf this information here, or these pieces of hardware here are either on the sensor and they're certainly on the base station that you're wearing that need to communicate. So here, the actuator nodes are usually transmitting information, but they also can be gathering information. There are uh, band networks that operate by, because they're so far away, because the, uh, the receiving station is so far away from, the no from nodes, that some nodes will pick up information from, from the neighboring nodes, then so daisy chain transmit that information along until it gets in range with the, uh, the local unit, then dump all the data into the local unit. So here, the personal device would gather all the information from the sensors and then uh, uh, display the, uh, sorry, transmit the information to an external unit picked up by uh, a nurse or a doctor or uh, just stored up on, the up on the cloud in order for it to make a decision on what is going to happen next. Here we have some of the information that you can see that here we have a data rate, we have a bandwidth, the number of uh, bits of accuracy. So you can see that it goes from uh, 16 bits here up to 
uh, a megabit per second here. So the bandwidth of the sensors and the information that needs to be transmitted is very different. And it has a very, very wide range. But imagine all of this stuff transmitting information all at once. So you have your little base station that you're wearing, and it's trying to gather up all this information. So what's the, what's the bandwidth that it needs in order to gather all the information from all these sensors that may be transmitting this information simultaneously? So it becomes a, a very difficult problem for uh, when you have just one sensor, no big problem. You have two sensors, eh. You start to get five, ten sensors, and when they're transmitting and how much information they need to transmit, that's all very, very important. And here we have a graph which shows uh, some of the, the, uh, the data rate versus the amount of power used of the, and the battery life here. This is where they're trying to uh, put together this new protocol, this uh, uh, 802.15.6 here. There's another one up here which we'll talk about called Zigbee. Zigbee up here is uh, sort of like Bluetooth, but it's more in line with, uh, with these uh, body area networks here. So Bluetooth is up here. You can see Bluetooth is uh, going to use quite a bit of power. Zigbee is down here where it may have uh, a slower data rate, but it's also going to be using a lot less power as well. So energy consumption is a very important part of deciding what to do with body area uh, networks. And so the network is going to be sensing, communicating, and processing information. So the wireless communications are the most power hungry of everything that you have here. The batteries, everybody knows the problem with batteries. They're bulky, they're, uh, they, they add a lot of weight to, to uh, the sensors. Um, if things are implanted for a very long period of time, I'm sorry, if they're implanted, like a cochlea implant or a pacemaker or something like that, then you're expecting the battery to last at least five years or more. And when you replace a battery, you recharge a battery, you have cost and convenience and, and sometimes life-threatening uh, uh, consequences of replacing batteries. Of course, you could always think about, gee, you can make energy. So they thought about that, and you can have, when people are moving, you can have uh, energy transmitted to the, uh, the sensors or to the base station. They also use body difference, uh, temperature differences on the body, from the body to the environment in order to generate energy, and other kinds of vibrations on the body, which uh, could do with uh, walking and dancing, <coughs> things of that nature. But the bottom line is, right now, we're unable to create enough energy to offset the amount of energy that's used. And so you're always running a deficit in all of this. Um, the problem is that aside from the amount of energy uh, that the, you can't produce enough energy, the problem also is you have the effects of energy on the body. So here, during communications, devices produce heat. Not good. So you have Sensors and the different nodes all can heat up because they're starting to use a lot of energy. Energy to compute things, energy to transmit things, anything, and energy to decode things. So everybody knows about the issue that we had many months ago about the laptop on male compute uh, on male laptops. It, you know, the, the Apple was heating it up, and men were becoming impotent because of the amount of heat that the laptops were producing. So now, don't imagine the laptop. Imagine you have all these little sensors on you. All of a sudden, they start heating up because they need to transmit information or gather information. The energy consumption needs to be minimized in order to save the uh, battery life, to prevent bat body damage that can occur when you have sensors uh, heat up on you. And the power absorbed by the tissue is this SAR, the specific absorption rate uh, that we talked about previously. So I just want to show you what the equation is for SAR. And the SAR has to do here with the conductivity, and P is the mass, uh, uh, the mass density of the tissue here, and this is the energy squared. So 
what's happening here, the mass density of the tissue and conductivity is always changing. Not, well, basically always changing because what's going on in your body is always going to be changing because it's very dynamic. And they looked at the, the uh, simulations of, this, these are simulations of how uh, different electromagnetic spectrum would be absorbed by the body. <clears throat> these were done by various institutions. And what I want to get to here is uh, the amount of energy that's, that's lost. You can see this here is about 45 decibels, and up here is about 140. Let me explain to you what a decibel is, because those you don't know. The, the uh, formula for a decibel is 20 times the log of base 10 of gain. So if you have a gain of 1, which means your input signal and your output signal are exactly the same, you have dB of 0. If you have a gain of 10, then you have a dB of 20. If you have a gain of 110, then your dB is minus 20. If you have a gain of, of, of 100, then your dB is minus 40. If you have a gain of minus 1,000, then your dB is minus 60. So from here to here is a loss of about 100 dB. That's a lot. It's not just oh, a change in gain of 100. No, it's not. We're talking about the log of the gain. So here is a huge change in gain that takes place with the signal. I'm going to have to quit so I'll show you this. Look at this. This is about 30 dB that drops to 60 dB. So that's a gain loss of 30 dB here. When you go from the hip to the hip, so it's going from here to here. What's the loss? The loss is tremendous when you're trying to go through the body. And so the networks don't go through the body because there's too much tissue there. Because we're one big bag of salty water. And so it doesn't want to do that. And so what happens is it travels along the skin. And if you put an electrode on the back, and you put an electrode on the front, and you think it's going to go through, it's not. It's going to have to travel around the edge, along the skin, until it gets there. And there's huge losses that take place in that path. And there are lots of reflections that take place in that path that cause interference. And what's interference? I know none of you know about this. When I was a kid, we used to have TVs that came from with, with, with rabbit ear antennas. And we'd be switching around the rabbit ear antenna, and we'd see Howdy Doody, and there'd be three Howdy Doodies on the screen. And why? Because the signal coming from the antenna that was transmitting the Howdy Doody program was not only coming to my antenna, but it was bouncing off the wall and then coming to my antenna. Bouncing off that wall and coming to my antenna, interfering with my picture of Howdy Doody. So the interference like that I've just explained with television happens in these body area networks when you have multiple paths that go from the transmitter to the receiver. And those interference patterns can interfere positively and they can interfere negatively which can cause you to lose tremendous amounts of signal. You know, this could be uh, a description of the kind of things that we would want to measure in DNA. And when we look at the, um, the different kinds of networks that are available, this of course is uh, not a BNA. This is just your regular hardware network that's on the ground with very strong stations and power and things of that nature. And this would be a body area network. And you say, well, what's wrong with this? The problem is that not only do you have weak sources, but you also have interference with, in this case, somebody else's body area network. So you could be picking up heart rate, pressure, or whatever uh, from this person and transmitting it to the cloud or transmitting it to your doctor. So there are several problems that have to be dealt with in uh, body area networks. We started talking about this. And we started talking about um, what kind of uh, loss, uh, the absorption rate, you know, the, we, when you put them on the body, you're putting them on a big sack of, of uh, salt water. And so the transmission of the information across the network that you're wearing is not very good. And when, oops, uh, hold on a second. And when we're talking about how much power are you going to be losing? So here are some examples. This is power in decibels. 
So the power, if you have one watt power, uh, shoot. No power. Oh, you're going to do Wow, that's fancy. Optimus Prime? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, that's good. All right. So, just to show you that, if you have one one watt in, you'll have ten watts out here, and here you have one watt in, but you have minus ten dB. You're going to have a tenth of a watt. As you go down to minus thirty dB, you're going to have uh, a thousandth of a watt. So, when we look at curves, or look at uh, how much power and how much power is lost, this is how much power is going to be lost in decibels. So you can see here, these are different frequencies uh, that are being transmitted, how much is going to be lost. You can see the loss can become quite significant. And we showed this before, and this is uh, going across the body. So you have a position here on the left hip, and it's going to a position on the uh, outside of the right hip, you can see that it's not going to go through the body, which is this part here, that you're going to end up with. You're going to want to go around the body. And so the amount of, uh, of loss is very, is, is very significant. So the, the transmission of the energy as you transmit it from one point to another is not going to go through your body. It's going to go around your body. And the other problem that you have when you go around the body is and this are these are some of the average levels of power for different positions of here uh, as you get farther and farther from the source. What's important is not necessarily the quantitative aspects of this graph, but to know that as you get farther from the source, you're going to start to uh, reduce the amount of power. It's going to be more difficult for you to pick up the signal from the noise that is being uh, that you're picking up. And these are some of the uh, data that was collected at different uh, frequencies, 2.36 hertz, you know, your, your phone in your house probably is running on 2 gigahertz. And you can see that we have here um, the amount of power that's, that you're going to uh, receive is going to get from a transmitter is going to drop significantly when the person is moving. Uh, it's much less when the person is stationary Jeez, I wish I could turn off the... <sighs> yes, thank you. I'm just, just, yes, just thank you. Uh, when a person is moving, and that's one of the problems with body area networks is if you have things on your arms, if you have things on your legs, you start moving, you start running, then all of a sudden the, uh, the path to whatever uh, uh, network is picking up the information is going to vary, and that's going to cause problems with the signal. So let's get through some of these. Multipath is probably one of the major problems in all of this. That is, uh, I mentioned last time that you know I used to watch Howdy Doody as a little kid. We had rabbit ear antennas, and so you move the rabbit ear antenna until Howdy Doody is in the triples. You know, you have a good clean picture of of uh, Buffalo Bob. So with multi-path systems that you have with networks, you're going to end up with the, your sensor picking up information from, sen uh, from another sensor on the body. But that pathway can go from, say, you have a sensor here and you have your detector here, uh, or transmitter here, and it's going to path this way. It can also path in different directions to get to the same spot. So with multiple paths, you have interference. That interference can call, in television systems, was ghosting. So you see multiple dimmer images of the same thing. In this case, if you have multiple signals coming in that are reflections or uh, uh, delayed in terms of their response, then you have a problem of knowing which is the signal and which is the corrupted signal. That is the signal that you don't want. If, for example, you're doing EKG, part of EKG is that you have signals from different parts of the body, the heart and your, your reference in, in another part of your chest, and you take those signals and you add them up and they produce the QRS function that you end up seeing on the EKG. Well, 
That's because this is all added simultaneously. And if that simultaneous, uh, um, simultaneous activity isn't simultaneous, then you're going to end up with abnormal EKG responses as, as an example. So this is looking at how many dB path loss that we have. So this is in front of the torso. This is going around the torso. This is the distance in meters that you have. And so you can see that there's a function here that grows as you get farther and farther one from the other. And there are um, measures of the loss of function, uh, sorry, the, the loss of, of signal around the torso that are extremely important. And that, again, change as the body moves. I put this up to show you that uh, the loss versus the frequency versus the amount of delay it's not, a, uh, it's not a Gaussian function, it's a Poisson function. So that you have a, a very sh sharp uh, increase that gradually dies out uh, as you go along the x-axis here. So this is showing you some of the uh, reflectiveness where you have your signal transmitting uh, along and here you have this uh, abnormal reflected signal that comes into the pathway and you have somehow to know whether it's a real signal or whether it's a bad signal or a reflected signal. I'm going to get rid of that, that, that. So here you can see that the effects of uh, received signals, our motion can uh, significantly affect communications when they block uh, the uh, LOS between the antenna, the loss of 30 dB between sensors and the transmitter, the thing that's going to gather up your signals and then transmit them. One of the big problems that they have, although I'm very surprised when I read this, the biggest problem they have is when you're wearing sensors is at night, when you're laying down, you're pressing up a sensor or uh, you, have, you have a strained body posture or something like that, and that can change, and artifacts can change, and cause the sensors to give wrong information. Now, the things that I've seen in terms of what you wear at night are these things that, what are they, on your, on your head? Is it like a big, I don't remember what it looked like, Jason. It was, a, it was something that you wear on your head and you yeah, sleep with. I can bring it in. Oh, good. So, uh, what people have looked at is to be able to uh, look at movement because they have some things that you can wear on your wrist when you sleep and it will then detect the amount of movement you have. From that they've done studies uh, apparently uh, to look at how much per a person moves when they're in REM sleep or when they're in different phases of sleep. They can transmit this information afterwards to a computer. The computer then plot what your activity uh, was during the night. These are the conducting uh, things. Yeah. So this little thing you wear on your head when you go to sleep. How was it wearing it when you go to sleep? Uh, it kept falling off. It kept falling off? So it, it works sometimes. It's good. Yeah. And it has uh, conducting uh, material. And it would measure your brain waves, basically. Uh, or your EMG activity of your muscles, if you're crinkling your muscles as well. But anyway, there's, there, there is some uh, interference. So this would measure your uh, brain activity and look at the EEG and say, well, you must be in REM sleep because we're picking up this kind of wave and that kind of uh, frequency and so on and so forth. And this information would be transmitted online to a little box that was sitting on your night table as you slept. So I, I use this slide um, because I wanted to show you what uh, the body-worn channels look like in terms of how much information or how much power is lost. Here we have the amount of uh, the, rec uh, the received signal strength in terms of minus dB. So you can see here that the, uh, in this case, this is the right angle, the blue is the right wrist, and you can see that during different periods of the time, we really don't get much above 40, minus 40 dB. That's a lot of signal 
uh, that's a very small signal to be picking up. And usually if you wanted to say an average, we say, well, the average is probably around 70 dB, minus 70 dB for these signals that are being picked up uh, by a sensor, um, by the receiver network. So there are other ways in which they try to transmit this information. This system here is a non-RF communication system. And what they wanted to use was a capacitive and galvanic coupling. And so we all know we have this galvanic response uh, in our skin. And they wanted to transmit the information through this medium that we have. And so the frequency of doing that, the frequency range of doing that, is somewhere between 10 kilohertz and 10 megahertz. Um, there could be interference in this case between the signals that you have and uh, low power data communications. Um, the way you would exchange information is perhaps you could shake hands with someone and then the information would transmit between the, 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 two, uh, the two people. And it has a very low uh, data rate. And the reason it has a low data rate is because of the amount of noise in the signal. There is a new protocol coming, which is 80215, I think it's called 6. Yeah, here it is, 802156. This is a new wireless protocol that is being designed specifically for body area networks. And it's low power. You know why you need low power. You can't stick a high powered anything on the body because of the uh, possibility that those radio waves are going to morph the material, the, the tissues of the body into something cancerous or, or tumorous. And, and that's been a real problem with uh, cell phones. There's a current network called Zigbee Network. Um, it's been used for wide, uh, for uh, body area networks. It's quick and easy. It's kind of like uh, Bluetooth, but it's of uh, uh, a little bit better uh, quality and it's lower power. And this is a, <clears throat> a statement of the, of the purpose of the 15.6 uh, protocol and some of the requirements. You can see it's ultra low power. This is a really a key component of this, ultra low power, uh, so that you can use it on implantable devices as well. And um, there is uh, medical, uh, I should have it worse. Uh, this is a medical implant uh, communication service, so this stuff would be compatible with things like transmitting information to cochlear implants, or maybe you have an implant in your body for other purposes as well, um, and control of the RF frequency. Now, one of the problems, yes? Tell me that there's some notion of security or encryption in that protocol. There is. Oh, thank God. Yes, they have encryption. I haven't gone into it. Um, but they do have encryption associated with that. Uh, that is a problem. That's a major problem with all of these things. Uh, and uh, I don't think that the solutions that they've been proposing are really ones which are implementable, mainly because the amount of, the more computing you do, the hotter the, the nodes become. And so you need more power. That's a very, very big problem. And speaking of power, as you increase the power, the nodes get hot. And when the nodes get hot, that's not a good thing that you want to have on your body. So they've come up with uh, an adaptive least temperature routing, which is, to me, it, this is really kind of grasping at straws. I think they're trying everything to try to reduce things. But what they're doing is, is if you have a, these sensors, and each one of the sensors will pick up information from a nearby sensor, then transmit that to its nearby sensors, those sensors pick it up, transmit it to the next set of sensors, and those sensors then transmit it to the, the receiver, which then uses it for some purpose. Now the problem is, you have a sender here that sends to this node, low temperature node. Now these nodes here are high temperature. So you say, okay, I have another node. I can choose this one or I can choose this one. This one's high temperature, so I'm gonna go in this direction, and I'm gonna go in this direction, and I'm gonna go in this direction, this one, this one. The problem that you have with this particular setup is that you're going in a very securitous route to get to here. And so there can be significant delays associated with it. So they have another, which is called adaptive, 
route in which you don't go all the way around. What you do is, after you go through three alternate routes, you then say, oh, enough is enough. I have to get to my destination or else it's going to be too late. And so you go and you use a hot node. Now, this sounds really interesting. The problem is the people who propose this have not described how you know these nodes are hot. So it's a great idea, but there's information that is missing. And if you're going to start transmitting to the other node saying, I'm hot, that's going to make you hotter. So there are different, I'm not saying this can't be solved, but I'm saying that it's a very clunky kind of a solution at this point. So I'm just, these are just some of the, uh, the transceivers that are available. Some of you already have seen this stuff. And this is uh, a body-worn sleeping channel. Remember the other one we had about 40, minus 40 dB and went to about minus 80 dB or something like that? This one, when you're wearing, look at this, minus 85 dB power loss down to minus 95 dB in some cases. So lying down and sleeping and trying to wear these sensors is really a big problem that needs to be solved if they're going to go in this in this particular direction, at least now using the RF systems that, that are currently available. And of course, uh, I'm going to skip through that. And again, security. So, you know, how are you going to secure it? How are you going to control the power? Where's the power going to come from? We talked about being able to use power from uh, the temperature differences in the body versus the outside, or maybe using muscle energy uh, or mechanical energy from the body to examine how things could be used to add power to the systems. But these systems are using more power than we can actually generate. And so we always end up having to wear some sort of battery pack of some kind in order to power everything. And the fact that we're radiating information, literally, we're radiating information makes this a, a, a severe problem for whether it's safe or not, whether the person wearing it thinks it's safe. So that's really an issue, is are people going to be acceptance, are they going to have acceptance of being able, of wearing these body area uh, networks if they think that they're not safe? So that's all I have on body area networks. Uh, this will end up, oops, sorry. This will end up on the, uh, the, the website, all of the slides. Okay. Any questions? You know, when I started this, and I started thinking about body area networks, I said, wow, this is so easy that all you have to do is go out and get these great, you know, press on sensors, stick them all over your body and then just transmit the information to your cell phone. Bingo, you're done. Well, it's not that easy. It's very, very complicated. 